Welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining us today. My goal is to help you get a better understanding of how you can bring back tangible strategies and resources to foster equity in your STEM programming. So to get us started, we'll take a quick look at what we'll be covering over the next 40 minutes or so. Uh, we will go over a quick welcome to just get to know each other real, really briefly, and then we'll go over the importance of gender equity in STEM, in particular due to our lens at Girls Who Code, touching upon other important aspects of our identities as well. And then we'll move into how to foster an inclusive environment, learn activities to create holistic programming, and then find out how to access free resources, and then we should have time at the end for some Q&A. So by the end of this session, you'll be able to walk away with best practices, language, and activities that can help you begin fostering equity right away. So before we, we, we begin, I'd like to just give you a quick background of, of my own journey and experience that shaped who I've become, which is important as you also bring your own experiences to the programs that you will lead. So my name is Poonam Gill and I'm the Regional Partnership Coordinator at Girls Who Code. I grew up in Indianapolis, I live in Central Indiana, and I went to Purdue and I have an electrical engineering degree. I've worked in manufacturing, so I know firsthand what it's like to be one of the few female engineers in the workforce, and in a lot of cases, the only female engineer. And I've spent the last decade really focused on how do we increase diverse representation in STEM and STEM education. And I've been with Girls Who Code now for about six months and really excited to work with the state of Indiana moving forward. And so now that you know a little bit about me, I would love to know a little bit about all of you. So if you could, you have a chat box on the bottom right hand corner. If you would like to type your name or where you're from or, or what you do in your work role, I would love to hear from you. And I'll just give you uh, just a little bit to do that. So we have children's librarian. Do we have anyone that works with teens? Okay, this is great. We see a variety of, of librarians that work with children and teens and, and adults as well. So um, thank you all for that. So before we dive into our, our activities, I'd also like to introduce who we are and what we do to give you context for our equity lens. At Girls Who Code, we're the, an international nonprofit and we're leading the movement to address the gender gap in technology. So our mission is to promote gender parity in the computing and technology sectors by inspiring, educating, and equipping girls with the skills they need to thrive. Before we dive into why STEM is important, I'd like to pull back the curtain and really define what computer science means and why we've chosen computer science to focus on at Girls Who Code. So what does the term computer science mean to you? When we look at the actual definition, it's the study of computers and algorithmic processes, including their principles, their hardware and software designs, their implementation, and their impact on society. That's a lot of words. Or we can put it simply, it is the process for how we communicate with computers to tell computers what to do. We believe that computer science is a great way to teach students valuable life skills. Coding is an endless process of trial and error. So if you are familiar with coding, you know that one comma or one semicolon can make the difference between a working code or failure. So coding requires resilience and imperfection. And as learners tinker with these challenges, they learn that it's okay to make mistakes and to embrace them as learning opportunities, which helps them remain brave and resilient in the future. So with this perspective in mind, we want to take a look at the importance of gender equity in STEM, as well as how our identities affect our experience as we move our young people from K to 12 to college and career. 
So as technology continues to shape the way we live, STEM education has become more and more important for our young people. Coding skills in particular have become one of the most sought after skills in the US economy. And today alone, there's about a half million open computing jobs in the United States, but only about 40,000 computer science graduates each year. Yet, in addition to the growth of these jobs, why else is computer science education important? So when we look at data, 58% of all STEM jobs are in computing. And the average salary of a computer scientist is about $100,000. And this means there's a huge opportunity here for students, especially of underrepresented backgrounds, to access more financial freedom and have greater socioeconomic mobility in this career. And plus, the jobs aren't only in the tech booms of Silicon Valley. In fact, 91% of these are located in other places all across the country. So there are opportunities everywhere. And not only that, people are surprised to see that 67% of those jobs are in non-technical fields. So if you think about medicine, agriculture, entertainment, manufacturing, finance, banking, the list goes on. There's so much opportunity here for young people in our community to use these skills for economic movement in a variety of different fields that they're passionate about. And so just like you see here, when we give our young people computing skills, they can unlock great financial opportunity, live anywhere, and do anything they're passionate about. But unfortunately, not everyone has been included in these opportunities. The problem is that the gender gap is actually getting worse. It's widening. In 1995, 37% of tech jobs were held by women. But today, only 23% are women. This is staggering, especially when we think about an even bigger gap of female representation and leadership positions within those tech companies. We need to have a more diverse representation of people in the door to provide them with more opportunities on an individual level, but also to be able to make innovative contributions to society through teams with more diverse perspectives. But in order to address this, we need to start earlier where women are drastically underrepresented in educational pathways. Right now, only 19% of students who receive degrees in computing are women, and only 2% who receive computing degrees are women of color. Why is this happening? Too often, boys are taught to aim high and take risks, while girls are taught to be overly cautious. Girls are socialized to avoid failure and risk as they aspire to perfection, which hurts them when it comes to exploring new interests like coding. And we need to teach students at a young age to build the confidence, skills, and engagement they need to persist in that field. According to our research with Accenture, 69% of the growth in the computing pipeline for gender equity would come from changing the path of the youngest girls, especially those in junior high school. So as figure one on the slide shows, experience of compute, computing in their junior high years means that girls are 18% more likely to show interest in computing throughout their high school and college years. So this is something to think about as you think about your library programs for children and especially for teens. We have to not only engage them at a young age, we, we have to be able to sustain engagement in high school to avoid that high school trap where previous gains in securing interest in computing and coding are lost due to a range of negative factors that have an impact at this next stage of their education. So to address these issues, we need to build a pipeline of brave girls that are inspired, educated, and equipped for these lucrative opportunities in college and career. And we can create an impact as a full community by building in more equitable practices in our STEM programs. Plus, this will not only positively impact the gender gap in tech, but is also incredibly important for all of our young people of historically underrepresented groups in the STEM industries. And we can do this by being positive role models and mentors for young people, creating a positive, inclusive, and brave community space for learning, providing diverse representation of role models in our curriculum, creating holistic programming to build essential life skills like bravery, resilience, and collaboration, and making connections between our curriculum, their real world experience, and their ability to positively impact their community.
Girls Who Code has already begun that work to help encourage girls to see computer science as part of their future and to drive the movement in addressing that gender gap in tech. So we have about 10,000 clubs in all 50 states and we've reached 185,000 girls to date. And 50% of our alumni are from historically underrepresented groups and 3,000 age college age alumni are choosing to major in computer science and related fields at a rate 15 times higher than the national average. And our black and Latina alumni are choosing these majors at a rate 16 times the national average. So our Girls Who Code Clubs are free programs for sixth through 12th grade girls to join our sisterhood of supportive peers and role models, and they learn to use computer science to change the world. We provide you with all of the curriculum and lesson plans, the support, and even the funding, and it's all for free, which is the best price. So anyone can start and lead a club. We have a lot of librarians across the state of Indiana who lead a club, and I also handle the state of Michigan as well. So we have Girls Who Code clubs and libraries across the state of Michigan. Many of our facilitators do not have prior coding experience, and that makes them really great role models as lifelong learners. So it's our goal at Girls Who Code to give you the comprehensive resources and support so that you can learn alongside girls. So to just give you a quick sense of how our programs work, this is something that can help you model the structure and resources for your own community. And I'll first walk you through what a club looks like as a sample. So typically each of our clubs start with a, an icebreaker, which we call a sisterhood activity. Um, and, then, and then girls will learn about women in tech spotlight. So this is um, inspiring and relatable role models in the industry through the women in tech spotlights. And then 40 minutes of that, the girls will learn about our different programming languages. So we have Scratch, Python, JavaScript, Thunkable, and our new set of tutorials using Swift that we've developed in partnership with Apple. So as they build their skills throughout their club experience, they're also working in teams to build a project that's focused on addressing a real world problem in their community that they care about. And then at the end of each meeting, they develop, they, they, work, they do a stand up which is developing a growth mindset by reflecting and sharing their work um, by receiving feedback and asking questions as well. So let's move into our recommendations for how to foster equity in your own STEM programming. According to our research, junior high school students with an inspiring teacher have led to an 18% increase of girls' interest in computing. And as you can see here, this also impacts high school experiences. 73% of girls who had a more inspiring teacher were more likely to go into computing or coding. So fostering inclusion really begins with you to bring out that inspiration. And as you think about your own middle or high school experience, I want you to think about your own role models that you looked up to and their qualities. And that can absolutely be librarians and community leaders. When I think about my high school experience, that was before computer science and engineering classes were available to us. And I went to a day camp that introduced engineering concepts and it was a facilitator in the community that led that. So absolutely we can have community leaders, teachers, neighbors, librarians serve as role models. How can you emulate those similar characteristics to show students that you care in a genuine, inclusive and authentic way? So in our programs, we recommend that facilitators use these guidelines for strong facilitation. And I'll go over some of our general recommendations at a higher level before we dive into each. First, you wanna make sure that you're modeling what you want to instill in your students. Make sure to use positive, inclusive, and strengths-based language and behavior. You also must use this model behavior across all of your young learners. As humans, we naturally are socialized to form our own biases and perspectives as we get older. So it's our job as role models to check those biases and actively work to respect and treat all learners regardless of sex, race, religion, disability, and other protected classifications. It's also important for your students to learn the basics of STEM curriculum. However, we also want them to leave with a strong, meaningful peer group and the strengths they'll need to continue studying STEM. So don't underestimate the importance of including group building activities to make time for students to reflect, play, and grow together, because that work is just as important as the things that they might create or programs that they might write. And we also encourage you to be part of the community, participate in the different activities, um, to help students see that you are their mentor and an active member of their community. 
We found that one of the trickiest things about running a Girls Who Code Club can be helping girls reflect honestly on their progress. Sometimes they might not be ready to admit that they need help. Other times friendships can be complicated and that can make it hard to give a friend critical feedback. So pay special attention to these moments in your own programs and encourage your students to speak their minds respectfully. And then when building your program, you, you will become that role model for your students. But you should also make time to showcase the diverse representation of role models. This way, your students can really see themselves reflected in the computer scientist or mathematician that they want to become. And as we think about modeling the language and behavior we want to see in our students, we must first fully understand the growth mindset perspective. And as I'm sure you've seen in your experiences, Students, and especially girls and students of color, can be socialized to default to a fixed mindset where they think, I'm not good at math, or I can't do it, or begin to see mistakes as failures that they should avoid. This mindset can become incredibly static and hinder their ability to succeed. So for example, many of our facilitators have a similar story. In the first week, a student will call the facilitator over and say, I don't know what code to write. The teacher will look at the screen, see a blank text editor. And if she didn't know any better, she'd think that her student had spent the past 20 minutes staring at the screen. But if she presses undo a few times, she'll see that she wrote the code, but then deleted it. She tried, she came close, but didn't get it exactly right. And instead of showing the progress she made, she'd rather show nothing at all. Mistakes are not an option for her. It is our jobs as educators and role models to transform this thinking into a more positive and solutions-oriented outlook. When we encourage our students to have a growth mindset, they can begin to see challenges and mistakes as learning opportunities. They'll be more likely to take risks, try new things, and be hungry to find ways to improve over time. These skills are invaluable and should be cultivated by addressing students' challenges in the moment. And you can encourage a growth mindset by building in a strengths-based approach to your language. When your learner approaches a challenge, it's important to help them to embrace it. Acknowledge that what they're working on might be hard, help them break it down step-by-step step so they can calmly approach a solution, and help them lean into discomfort by celebrating their mistakes as learning opportunities, or find ways to use their strengths in creative ways to address these challenges. We also need to break students out of the mindset that the problem is with them as a person. So for example, a computer science professor had often found that young men come into his office hours and say, there's a problem with my code. Yet young women would come in and say, there's a problem with me. To change this mindset, be mindful about your framing to always describe a student's actions and not the learner when helping them improve. So not only promoting the non-judgmental framing, but also you, you practicing personal responsibility with your vocabulary, both out loud and in your mind. So for example, when you begin to see a student as a poor learner or not a real coder or a problem child, you will continue to treat them intentionally or unintentionally as such. And when you do so, catch yourself to remain respectful and equitable amongst all of your learners. And you can begin doing this by focusing on the learner's effort bravery and resilience, the life skills required for success. Rather than saying, it's because she's so smart or such raw talent, instead recognize and shout out the ways that they persevered when facing a challenge or how they were brave for asking a question about the project. And lastly, know your own strengths and when to ask for help. We're all human with flaws and we make mistakes. So find your own best qualities and find others to help complement you to build your own support system. For example, in our Girls Who Code clubs, facilitators often do not have coding experience before they get started. So they might have teaching experience maybe, but they lean on our club success specialists to help explain key concepts or they nominate and select students as their teaching assistants to help support other, other kids in their club. So building a close-knit community that encourages each other can help you implement these tips smoothly. And in any STEM program, it's important that your students learn the basics of computer science and other STEM concepts. But the most impactful piece of your programming must be to build more than code. 
In addition to the life skills that we instill in our students, we also have a heavy emphasis on building sisterhood or a sense of supportive peer network and community. In our Girls Who Code Clubs, we help them do this by leveraging group building activities called sisterhood activities to make time for club members to reflect, play, and grow together. And remember that not only should your girls participate, but you should also do as well, especially with icebreakers, because that helps girls see that you are their mentor and an active member of their community. So with coding in particular, I want you to picture a coder in your mind. When most people think of a coder, they often th have a stereotypical idea of what a coder or a STEM kid looks like. Maybe you think of a guy in a hoodie in a basement in Silicon Valley, maybe drinking Mountain Dew, who might not have ever seen the light of day. Maybe like this guy or this one. These are the pictures that often pop up when you Google coder or computer scientist. And that's not always the case. And we want to change the idea of what a programmer looks like and what they can do. So we strongly believe in the idea that it is hard to be what you cannot see. That is why it is so important to have more representation of inspiring and diverse role models that reflect the experiences of the people in your community. You should especially make sure to include role models of all facets of identity as well, especially for underrepresented groups. And that includes and is not limited to the discipline or field that they're in, ethnicity, gender, race, social class, religion, ability, age, and many more. This doesn't only help your students see themselves reflected, but also helps them learn about other identities in a supportive and respectful way. For example, in one of our rural clubs in Idaho, the facilitator said that her club of boys and girls often did not get exposed to people who do not look like them outside of their rural mountain community. So she was able to showcase our Girls Who Code Women in Tech Spotlights to introduce ideas of difference in identity to her club in a safe and approachable way. So to give you a sense of our Women in Tech Spotlight structure, we highlight women from a variety of different backgrounds and a variety of sectors such as art, science, education, or business. Facilitators will find on our online learning management system everything they need to successfully incorporate a Women in Tech Spotlight into their sessions by choosing a sector, and then they find a female role model within that sector and read about them and watch a video to highlight and discuss how they use computer science in their career. And we found this model of reading, watching, and reflecting really beneficial to introduce these role models. Each Women in Tech Spotlight ends with discussion questions centered on key development concepts that we hope to instill, bravery, resilience, creativity, and purpose. So for bravery, girls discuss how each woman pushes new boundaries and takes bold risks, such as coding a new website or pioneering a new concept in computer science. For resilience, girls consider how the challenges each woman experiences in the technical world influences her ability to overcome them. Did any particular experiences, people, or resources help her succeed? For creativity, girls discuss why her work is innovative and different than the status quo, and think deeply about your creative solutions to problems in the world. For purpose, we know that each woman draws inspiration from a personal experience, so girls discuss what makes her work important and exciting to her and society and how it relates to her purpose. Our Women in Tech Spotlights are only a few of the many women in tech who exist, so if you have a particular role model or inspirational short story to share, make sure that everyone hears that. And if you choose to do so, figure out what questions you would want the group to discuss after the share out. So now that you know how to build an inclusive environment for your STEM program, let's see how to make it as holistic as possible. And I'd like to start by sharing our overall educational philosophy to see elements that you can adopt in your own community. And the first pillar of our philosophy is more than code. As I mentioned, we're not just teaching girls how to program, we're teaching them computational thinking, how to break down problems and think creatively. 
These technical skills are not only great to have in any profession, but learning coding is also a great tool to help girls build character traits like bravery, resilience, and curiosity. And this has the potential to have an enormous impact on how they approach challenges and whether they stick with coding and STEM in the years to come. The second pillar hood is second pillar is sisterhood. So research has shown that having a supportive group to learn and grow with can help with retention. So we really want our learners to feel supported through a community feel, showing role models that look like them in tech who are doing cool and inspiring things. And then our final pillar is real world relevance and impact. We know that education becomes that, that much more powerful when what we are learning is relevant to our lives and our interests. So we want girls to know that they can use computer science to change the world and can use these skills no matter what they want to be when they grow up. And they don't have to choose one aspect of their identity and let others go. They can grow their many passions and interests and combine those with their computer science skills to make a difference. But when implementing your own programming, see how to make these connections through the activities you select, the community you create, and the connections you make to your students. So here's an example of how we implement our educational philosophy into our curriculum. And after we do an icebreaker and a women in tech spotlight, we move into activities related to the project in the self-guided tutorial. So in each tutorial, students focus on learning about the big idea for a key coding concept. They learn it to be brave as they try out the new coding concept. They explore it by growing their creativity as they experiment and check their understanding. They build it to have a purposeful connection of these new concepts to the theme of their Girls Who Code project. They share it to get feedback from their peers and help improve their creations. And then they look ahead to what's next to preview the content for the next session as they challenge themselves to be resilient and continue learning. And when going through these tutorials, we always encourage our girls to learn through building, partner up and use each other as a resource to build community, and encourage girls to choose things based on what they're interested in and not just the level of difficulty. Students are much more likely to learn and grow when they build things they care about, so find ways to make connections to your students. And you can help your students to feel even more engaged as well to build essential leadership skills and responsibility by creating leadership opportunities within your program. So for example, we have five different sample roles that, that we use. Uh, we have a technology officer that assists a facilitator with routine maintenance of equipment. The coding coach will assist facilitators with implementation of activities. The social media chair will assist with documentation, taking photos, maintaining a blog to showcase the club activities. The project lead assists the facilitator with the timely com completion of meeting benchmarks and submitting the project to the project gallery. And then the supply monitor assists the facilitator with keeping track of supplies and snacks. So find what would work well for your students and make space for them to grow as young leaders. So we've been talking a bit today about our Girls Who Code project and how it can help make the curriculum real world relevant and impactful. So I want to give you a few examples of some of the projects that our girls have done to learn coding skills and to really start building. And um, a lot of our learners will create websites, apps, or games. Some of the projects include Save the Turtles, which is a game that girls develop to spread awareness about ocean pollution. Hungerlist was an app that helps people find donation locations for donating food to people in need. And Vibes is a website that girls created to support mental health needs, just to name a few. So let's take a look at one of our activity examples that some of our members might do. Before they start working on their project, we have them pick a topic for their project in groups. And their topic can be anything that they dream up. It can be about spreading the word about how awesome their favorite books are to the importance of conserving water. So as a sample, we have a find your focus dot voting activity. And in a typical club, girls would write different social topics that they care about, and then each of them will get to vote for their top three. So then they um, put a dot on each topic that they would like their team to focus on. And the topic with the most votes would be the focus of their GWC project. So in your STEM programs, begin thinking about how to craft projects and activities that would help ignite your students' interests and merge their skills and their passions to create something that's very meaningful. 
And then lastly, when we talk about curriculum, we also look at the importance of reflection. The last portion of one of our clubs is, is called a stand-up, and that's a practice that real software developers use to keep other members of their team up to date on what they're working on and what they might need to help with and any accomplishments that they've made. So in each session, we'll have a stand-up prompt, and that is a chance to celebrate and get feedback and ask for help. So that those questions will include things like, what did you accomplish in this meeting? Give an example of how you were brave, resilient, creative, or purposeful. Do you need help with anything next meeting? Or shout out a clubmate for something that they've accomplished. So for today's workshop, I want you to I want to encourage you to do your own reflection of what your next steps will be to bring equity and inclusion into your own practices. So before we end today and move into a Q&A, I want to share with you a few of our Girls Who Code resources that you can access to help get you started or supplement the work that you are already doing in your library. So many of the activities highlighted today have been taken really straight from our Girls Who Code Clubs curriculum, but we've really just scratched the surface. And as I mentioned, we have free curriculum that features over 120 hours of um, coding tutorials, training, ongoing support, alumni benefits, and we do give funding as well to ensure that each facilitator can successfully run their club. And this is, again, completely free, and you can access this curriculum by applying for a club at girlsuco.com slash club. So make sure that you apply before March 31st to get started, and you can pilot that program in the spring. And I, I would suggest, if you're interested, to go ahead and sign up today, and that at least gives you access to all of our resources that are free. And then we're also excited to share our free and downloadable women in tech lesson plans that can be used directly in your library. So these lesson plans align with middle school ELA math and CSTA standards, as well as the new computer science standards. So while furthering essential skills like reading and critical thinking. Infuse existing lesson plans with computational thinking concepts across non-computer science sub subjects. So if you have a month where you're talking about the Industrial Revolution, you can include the lesson plan on Ada Lovelace. And help change perceptions by demonstrating the important innovations diverse females are making in computing. That will help change the perception of who can or should be a computer scientist while also um, introducing diverse role models. So you can feel free to download these right off of our website. And lastly, we have quite a few other resources, including our best-selling books, an activity book, our Brave Not Perfect podcast with interviews from brave women worldwide, and then we have a sisterhood campaign where we bring our international community together on Day of the Girl. And so I hope that these resources are helpful to kick off the conversation for how to bring equity into your community. And just so you know, if you do decide to start a club um, in an elementary school level, third to fifth grade, you do receive five free books with each of those clubs. So that's also something to keep in mind. And funding that you receive, um, even for a sixth through 12th grade club, can be used to purchase books focused on coding. So before we end off today, I'd love to see if you have any specific questions about what we've covered or any strategies and tips from your own experiences that you'd like to share with the group. And you can, you can write your questions in the chat box, and I'll just give you about a minute to do that. Okay, we received a question. As a public library, my biggest problem with coding clubs is getting a study group to attend so I can carry over projects or lessons from one session to the next. How would you suggest handling each session with an ever-changing group? 
So this is really a great question. What you can do, and I really would like to highlight, our Girls Who Code curriculum is super flexible. So we have, if you log in and create an account, we have a standard club, a mini club, a plug and play, curriculum that you can use to implement into your programs already. Um, what you could do, and this is something I've suggested to other organizations, if you wanted to do like a, like a boot camp on a Saturday, maybe it's like a two hour session, you can go through our curriculum and, and put together something that you think would work um, you, and, and focus on just that. Maybe it's just one Saturday, um, or you could do like a series of, of days in a row. You really think about what works for your community. Uh, again, our curriculum is extremely flexible, so we really want you to be able to use these free resources to the best that you can that works for your community. So you can absolutely kind of do it in like a, like a one day time frame. And if you need help with that, I would be happy to, to help you out with that. Any other questions? So great question. How can you encourage girls in a co-ed setting? That is really a great question. We do have boys that are in our clubs and um, you know we are certainly not exclusionary, but I have an example of a club that runs in Fishers where um, there's one facilitator, but she has boys that are interested in coding as well. So what she does is she separates the girls into one group and the boys into another. And she uses our Girls Who Code curriculum with the girls and actually uses code.org, which is one of our partners um, with the boys. And so they get to decide what it is that they wanna work on separately. That is one thing that I have actually seen in practice that you could try out um, and, and see how it goes. But certainly our curriculum is focused on, you know, how we encourage girls in a, in a female setting to, you know, surrounded by a sisterhood of their peers to pursue computer science. So separating them out is what I saw happen in Fishers. And it seems to be they, they've been running the club all year and it's been successful for them. So another question we received, if you only have five Chromebooks available for a club, do you recommend allowing girls to partner up or just limit each session to five girls? Partnering up is a great idea. Um, we usually recommend about 10 girls per club. We, do, we certainly have clubs that have you know, 20, 30. It really just depends on what you can handle, but 10 is typically what we recommend. You only need three girls to qualify for funding. Um, so if you, it's really up to you. If you want to just limit the session to five girls, you can create two clubs. So you can have uh, one girl, one club with five girls and another club with five girls, and both clubs will qualify for separate funding. So the, we have another question about um, if, this, if the curriculum can be used on iPads. We do recommend Chromebooks, laptops, MacBooks. iPads can be used for our Swift tutorials. So they can be used for a specific programming language that we do offer. Uh, another question about if, if, if boys are interested in attending the program and, um, you know, should we let them attend and proceed as normal or change the curriculum a bit? It's really, again, it's completely up to you. Um, you know, we don't exclude boys from our, our programs, but um, again, like the example in Fishers, they decided to, the, the girls and the boys meet at the exact same time, but they separate into small groups and, and, and the teacher uses different curriculum for both. And if you, you can absolutely use the Girls Who Code curriculum with the boys and maybe they focus on their own project. Um, it's really what you think works best for your community. Um, I just wanted to give you a, a real life example that's happening here in Indiana.
Another question, do you have promotional materials with bullet points? We absolutely do. Um, if you log on to girlswhocode.com slash clubs apply and apply to start a club, and you don't have to know when you're going to start a club. You can just put in a tentative date and you can absolutely change it later. But that gives you access um, to all of our marketing material. So you will get access to our flyers to recruit students for the club, um, and you'll get access to uh, flyers for parents, um, and also uh, material that's in different languages as well. So that will give you access. And what I can do is um, after our webinar, I will follow up um, with the Indiana State Library with some of our own flyers that we use. But if you want some more in-depth material for a particular audience, I would recommend signing up on, on our website and um, then you'll be able to download that material. And it's completely free. Another great question, if you are a male, can you lead a club? Absolutely, we absolutely have men that lead clubs. Um, our only requirement, you have to be over the age of 18, pass a background check. You don't have to have any computer science experience because we, we do give you that, that training. And we absolutely have men that lead our clubs. So a really great question about, you know, we discussed how to help girls with the high school trap, but how do you get them interested in the first place? How do you get them into the door? That's a really great question. And, you know, we talked about, you know, the marketing materials, but, you know, I think that's one of the conversations that we're having is what research shows is that if girls feel like they can make a positive impact on their community and they can be creative and use their create creativity skills, they're more likely to, to pursue computing or STEM. But it's really kind of changing that image of what that is. Um, so that's why we really focus on, you know, Girls Who Code, it's not just about learning to code. We can change the world through this and, and use coding to, to do that. Um, so for example, I'll give you an example of a club in Indiana they were based out of uh, Terre Haute, actually. Just last month, a group of sixth, sixth graders decided to build a website that um, collected donations for foster children in their community. Sixth graders were able to do that. And these girls came together and came up with a problem in their community, something that they cared about, and they used those skills of coding to, to be able to do that. So it's, it's showing them that it's not just about sitting behind a computer and, and doing something that seems really boring. It's actually very interactive and collaborative, bring their friends along um, and be creative. We've, we have a project gallery online on girlswhocode.com and it showcases a lot of the amazing projects that, that our clubs have done. And we have, we have girls that create video games with all female characters because they were tired of seeing video games that, that didn't just have all, an all female cast. So um, they've created apps. Um, so I think it's maybe kind of focusing on that end goal that you know you wanted to learn how to design a video game or an app. Um, you know, those are some kind of ideas and, and, and happy to brainstorm with you on, on what we can do. Can girls bring their own computers? They can. We don't have any, any rules about that. Really great questions. Do we have any other questions? I hope I was able to to answer those questions to you know to the bet to for you to and um, if you have any other questions or need additional support please reach out to me and I will put my email up here in just a second so please feel free to email me if you have any additional questions Thank you all again for joining. 
And um, you, if you have any questions about an individual application, you can visit our website or email our customer care team at clubs at girlsucode.com. If you have specific questions about your program or launching maybe multiple clubs in your library, um, you can certainly email me at punam.gill at girlsucode.com. Um, so thank you to all of you for taking the time to learn more about how to foster equity into your STEM programs. And I wish you the best of luck as you inspire young learners all throughout your community.